learn from each other try to get over this crisis situation so it is because of this reason only we are uh, organizing some discussions uh, with our all senior colleagues and some uh, uh, good learned faculty member and you are watching it live on the zoom platform of uh, our AUSD digiconnect webinar series uh, today is the 18th issue of the series one on 1st of august 2020 uh, today is saturday and it is my pride, proud privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Professor Tamrish Kohl. And Dr. Kohl is, uh, is uh, a well-known figure among our fraternity. Dr. Tamrish Kohl is the chairman of the Medior Institute of Emergency Medicine at Medior Hospital, Delhi NCR, and medical director, Medior Hospital, Manesa Gurgaon, India. And he is the past president of the Society for Emergency Medicine, India. President of Patient Society for Emergency Medicine and Chair for uh, Chair of Disaster Medicine, a special interest group of International Federation for Emergency Medicine. And he also serves as a visiting professor at University of South Wales in UK. Uh, Dr. Cole is also an alumnus of the International Visitor Leadership Program uh, for the year 2013 in crisis and disaster management. He is uh, his interest areas are emergency care system uh, development, academic emergency medicine, clinical governance, resuscitation, science, trauma care, mass gathering, medical care, pandemic response, and trauma care. Doc Dr. Professor uh, Tamrish Cole is also the president of the Asian Society of Emergency Medicine, that is ASEM. Uh, so now may I request uh, our president, Dr. President of uh, Delhi branch of I, uh, IUH, that is USD, Dr. Gajan Kumar, to give his welcome address. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandeep. Uh, good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to this 18 series of our webinar. And in fact, uh, what I have noticed that not only we are able to socialize through this mean, we are also updating our, our knowledge every week uh, through this medium. So today, speaker, I especially welcome Dr. Cole, who is a very renowned speaker and expert in the field. And he is taking a very, very important topic, especially in this uh, time of uh, COVID and, uh, pandemic. So with these words, I welcome you all. And uh, now I hand over to Dr. Sandeep to start with the proceedings. Thank you, sir. So I would uh, request uh, everyone to mute themselves and uh, uh, they can also put the question answers and uh, uh, in the Q and A uh, uh, box. And uh, Professor Tamrish Kohl, sir, uh, I invite you for uh, this uh, your deliberation. And uh, you know that uh, this uh, this Corona crisis is a major epidemic or pandemic, and this this can overwhelm. It, this has overwhelmed the capacity of our outpatient facilities, ambulance services occupational centers within industries, emergency department, hospital, intensive care units. And there is critical shortage of staff, space, and supplies uh, with serious implications across the globe. So uh, we would like to learn from you, sir, how, uh, what are your guidelines for, uh, for managing all this emergency care and how to triage the patients and how to make the effective utilization of our healthcare facilities and uh, any message for our employers, our employees, and for everyone, how what role they should play to protect themselves and each other and help further uh, to further prevent the spread of the disease. Sir. Professor Cole, sir, you can uh, you have shared your screen. You can start your uh, presentation. Sir. Okay, so thank you and uh, good afternoon and for this opportunity. And uh, the topic which I am going to discuss today, the concept is uh, IC standard of care and. Uh, this is very much applicable in the current situation. Now, this is nothing new or this concept, although it, it, it is originated from United States, but it is now globally applicable. And in our country also, through public health principles to governmental directions, we are already using it. So my job is to remind you on the core principles and how we can use it more effectively. So as Sandeep said, I bring greetings from four organizations I'm not going to detail because you already introduced it. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, this news, uh, which 
just came on 29th of uh, July. Uh, it was a very, uh, you know, a, a strong critic on, on mainly the COVID care, which is the healthcare system, uh, which was is currently happening across the country. So as we all know, you know, uh, when the COVID started uh, in China, there were an initial period of uh, ignorance or take it granted or not understanding the severity of the problem. Uh, it was, uh, you know, we cannot uh, rewind that same thing. And most of the countries, uh, you know, was not prepared and uh, we allowed global travel to happen. So when the COVID came, uh, it was already a bit late and cases were increasing and somewhat we did not follow or did not understand the public health principles and the exponential figures on which the COVID can increase and quickly uh, crumble our healthcare system. And what happened is exactly written here in, in a news format that when COVID started, we started admitting all cases. There was panic. You know, I remember there were police escorting patients to hospitals and get admitted, even if there were almost no symptoms and, uh, you know, things like that. Then number was rising and uh, there was of course a scramble to tackle the bed shortage. There were, uh, you know, effort to increase the bed setup. There was effort to capture the private hospital beds and, you know, all that story happened. Then there was a rush to enhance the ICU, ventilator, oxygenated bed, inadequate ambulance fleets, and then the governments or the state machinery came helplines, underestimated the demand lines were clogged. There were dashboard or app set up, especially in Delhi, you can clearly remember they were not giving real time information. So the patients were ferried between one hospital to another hospital and some of the patients actually lost life on just in front of the hospital or in emergency. Then of course there is this media report on black marketing or refusal of baits by private hospital. And then, then there was a move to cap charges and so on and so forth, okay? So in a nutshell, it clearly shows that there was lack of proper planning in terms of estimation, in terms of uh, capacity building, in terms of how we manage our capabilities and what we need at what point of Now, Again, what has happened has happened and uh, we must now be very uh, sure or serious or make effort on how do we move forward. Because you must have observed now major metro cities, COVID is spreading to smaller towns, uh, some of the states which have very less or fragile healthcare system. That is one. Really, the other disasters like uh, flood, or uh, you know, or maybe an outbreak of dengue. They are not going to stop because the COVID crisis is ongoing. So you can see some of the states, like Tama Bihar is also dealing with flood along with COVID. So now is the time to reinforce the uh, response and do a very uh, good strategic planning. of actually principles or compendium of that strategic planning on how it can be planned and what are the ways to go forward. And I must thank uh, Dr. Sandeep because he brought this topic in my into my attention and say, why don't you speak on solutions uh, on on the, you know, on certain, uh, you know, important touch points if patients go. For example, if the patients are, you know, employ, or employees of industries and, you know, are in the industrial area and we receive patients. The touch points will be the workplace or the occupational health center. And if or she is sick, she will be brought by an ambulance to so the second touch point. Then they will brought to an emergency department third and fourth will be either COVID or ICU. So he said, uh, Dr. Sandeep asked me to, you know, look into the areas on how we can apply the crisis standard of care into this. And that's how this lecture is planned. And I hope that it will be purpose. So we just discussed that we are in crisis. And in crisis, we have to find a way forward to go, go uh, and deal with it. Now, one thing we need to understand that if we have to cater one patient versus 10 patients versus 100 patients, 1,000, 
thereafter we cannot have the same policies or same standard of care to be maintained at all times for all patients therefore the concept of tri world uh, during world war as you know or even before that uh, there was a surgeon general napoleon's army who were triaging patients triaging soldiers actually those who were very sick were transported to hospital those who were not very sick were given first aid and sent to battle field after the world war happened and triage happened. so the basic concept of triage was exactly this that how to handle a situation where there is a demand supply problem and this is again elaborated in a crisis situation in in form of crisis standard of care okay so what exactly it is so crisis standard of care is defined as you know a substantial change in healthcare operations and the level of care it is possible to devel, uh, deliver which is made necessary by pervasive disease pandemic influenza or catastrophic disaster like earthquake and hurricane however this change in the level of care delivered is justified by specific circumstances and should not be continued forever and it is formally declared by a state government in recognition of the crisis that the crisis operation will be in sustained period this concept was developed in 2009 in uh, uh, under the guidance of institute of medicine because they were facing similar problems and they, they, there was a report Uh, which was shared and then they implemented it now we are actually doing the same thing but in a different name you must have seen the government is issuing uh, or the ministry of family uh, welfare is issuing clinical guidelines and that clinical guidelines is evolving based on the situation and based on the current discoveries so it is not the stat clinical guideline which is produced similarly the testing strategies are also changing now these two things have got the formal declaration of the government or governmental wing and we are using it so in a form this is what is crisis standard of care Al although there are you know certain ramification of it but this is an example how crisis standard of care works now i have the good fortune uh, to work with uh, this gentleman who actually i invited uh, last year in our conference this is uh, dr dan hanfling who works in innova health system in washington dc and he was actually the co-chair of that uh, committee which wrote this report so as and when the covid started on march 28 dan and his team wrote another uh, statement <clears throat> on crisis of care and its application of covid 19 pandemic and i will use this as a reference uh, you know as i talk through and you can uh, you know uh, easily download this material and read the you know rest of the report and this is very very useful because this is a real application of crisis standard of care in covid 19 now in 2013 uh, uh, another article which dan wrote is the role of healthcare providers in catastrophic disaster response planning he raised certain pertinent questions so before covid we know the last pandemic of that size was 100 years back 1918 and human memory is very short and after that two world war happened lot of things changed and we have almost was forgetting that the there is there possibility of pandemic although we encountered h1n1 and uh, sars and mars but something of this Uh, pattern we were not anticipating and dan was exactly talking the same thing that the possibility of such event and if that event happens what an healthcare professionals would know on how to respond and prioritize delivery of life saving medical care to 1000 10000 of patients and making the current uh, decision now i'm not going to details of this article so the point i am trying to make is that there was very little sensitivity among us on possibility of pandemic and how to frame a pandemic response because the last pandemic of this nature happened 100 years back now 
what is exactly uh, crisis trend of care i discussed with you now when to adopt this care there are four situations you have to adopt this standard first of all there has to be severe shortage of equipment supplies and pharmaceuticals which is you can see is happening in many parts of the world during covid then secondly more important is an insufficient number of qualified healthcare providers you open the media reports today or you know watch any news channel you will see there is a lack of healthcare providers in many parts of the country lot of healthcare providers are falling sick there are lot of healthcare providers who are not medically eligible to respond to covid and same time there are a lot of healthcare providers you will see who are sitting as a redundant workforce whom we can quickly train if we accept that crisis standard of care and then uh, deploy them into operations and i will talk that in detail on you know there are certain uh, practical things which are actually happening in india as well so we will give those examples then there there is overwhelming demand of services you can see delhi was such an you know glorifying example uh, about 3 4 weeks back there was overwhelming demand and the supplies were less and lastly there were lack of suitable resources so when these four conditions are met or any two or three are met then it is good enough to adopt the crisis standard of care because we know that under these circumstances it will be sometimes impossible to provide care according to the conventional standards used in non disaster situations and in most extreme circumstances if there is almost no resource it will be not possible to provide the most basic life sustaining interventions to all patients who need them i just want to quote here the example of italy in bergamo italy at one point of time they were deciding on patients who will receive the ventilatory care or will not receive and they had a cut off over the age of 65 and certain other parameters on which they did, decided to adopt this crisis standard of care and did not provide ventilator to those patients and ultimately those patients did not make it so this is an extreme example in which a place of a country can act and save the healthier population the poor patients who can make it now here again we have to understand two important concept one is called surge capacity and surge capability i'm sure most of you are familiar just to uh, recapitulate surge capacity is the ability to evaluate and care for a markedly increased volume of patients one that challenges the normal exceeding operating normal operating capacity the surge requirements may extend beyond the direct patient care and include such task such as extensive lab studies epidemiological investigation radiologic studies and so on and so forth the surge capability the meaning of it is the ability to manage patients requiring unusual or highly specialized medical evaluation or care such requirements span the range of specialized medical health services that are not normally available at a location where they are needed for example here it is given pediatric care provided at a non pediatric facility or burn care provided non burn center now in terms of covid we have seen in certain places where there was a requirement of high level intensive care but the high level intensive care both in terms of capacity and capability both of expertise were not there by now we, have, we must have understood that covid is not only the disease of respiratory system one of the most dread complication of covid is it creates micro clots and these clots can create havoc inside the body in terms of stroke in terms of mesentery ischemia peripheral uh, acute ischemia and so on and so forth so this requires a very high level of intensive care setup and sometimes this capability also needs to be in place when there are required so we must understand the difference between such capacity and capability i mean more or less what we have observed that the doctors or experts to understand it but the decision makers do understand this of this concept uh, you know too well because if you observe the efforts to make a large field hospitals 
and then struggle to develop capability to manage it and then ultimately call the you know the medical for uh, uh, experts from armed forces or you know somewhere else so the crisis standard of care is intricately uh, connected with these two concept and we must keep in mind that when we are developing capacity we must also look into capability now how do we switch between one other when we are talking of conventional surge capacity that means the surge which we can manage through our conventional capacity and capability through our existing staff we follow conventional standard of care then there is a uh, period or phase of contingency where we follow contingency standard of care and finally come crisis now what are exactly this is described in this slide in conventional cap, uh, <clears throat> care or conventional standard of care there is no alter standard there is no resource constraint you are not practicing outside your experience that means the icu is managed by internists experts who can manage the icu and the focus of care is patients so you look you look after 10 patient 15 patient 20 patients and you maintain your standard of care in contingency what happens is your standard of care is slightly altered because you are slightly resource constraints for example in the, if there is a requirement of 10 intensivists to manage an icu you have only six so somehow so you double shifts or you manage although this you know uh, uh, poses a risk in 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 covid era because you cannot have people uh, inside icu for long time so therefore therefore it is compensated to use of technology and i'll come to some of the examples inside icu and how to adopt technology and reduce the exposure but you do that still you do not practice outside your experience icu is still managed by intensivist because the focus of care is patient but when you go into crisis and you see large number of patients who cannot manage you alter the standard of care because you are severe resource constraint and you need to encourage or train people outside their practice experience for example if there are doctors who have not worked in icu but have worked in the anesthesiology or they are working long time in emergency rooms they can be trained on certain modules and be posted to icu under supervision of an intensivist so that's how you develop crisis standard of care because now the focus is population which is the focus in covid care as well so how do you develop it and how do you organize it so this is a quick you know flow chart on how do you do it in terms of space is <clears throat> you use the in conventional you use the usual patient care space in contingency you repurpose a uh, patient care space again in in example of icu you can use the you know pre operative or post operative area of operating theater as an icu extension of icu or you can take over the dialysis unit and there are many examples like that but in crisis if the facility is damaged or unsafe or, or not successful then you take up areas which is not meant for conventional care so for example in terms of icu again i am giving icu example again and again is that you can take up ward areas large general ward and set up icu facility in terms of a ward care you can have them set up in another open space or you know a lot of uh, uh, banquet hall been taken in delhi so you go for unconventional spaces some of the case uh, you know occasions people have attached hotels to the hospital because the covid requires isolation so hospitals were connected to hotels so these are conventional spaces again in terms of staff as i mentioned earlier the usual staff is used in conventional you extend the staff in contingency and in crisis you look into the redundant workforce which is available in that point of time in that area and try to train them and always make them work under supervision of the specialist in supplies again in contingency you conserve you adapt something but in crisis when the critical supplies are lacking you need to reallocate 
life sustaining resource so you can do two approach here as i told in italy they used a uh, uh, algorithm and uh, you know they did not ventilate patients who are certain year of age alternatively you can see in many parts of the world or in india they uh, you know uh, the technological partners they developed circuits in which one ventilator can ventilate up to two three patients so this is how you reallocate resources and this is exactly then boils down to what we call as crisis standard of care please note that this has to be used in extreme operating conditions and on, only in certain period of time not forever and only after the direction of local authority or acceptance and that should come as an order now what is the problem with covid or you know what is the scope of using crisis standard of care in covid you can see this is the exponential rise of covid cases in india this is to july 28 and if you see uh, you know the the curve in which the uh, crisis standard of care or contingency should be used is in the ascending arm of the demand supply curve generally it is a bell curve and there is a ascending arm there is a plateau and there is a descending arm so if you see the graph of this country right now it is typically the steep ascending arm and again if you look into our country's distribution our country is actually conglomeration of many countries if you look it epidemiologically and well some parts of the country the cases are plateauing or in the decreasing trend or healthcare facilities are not burdened some parts of the country it is overwhelmed and there are some states where the crisis is just you know started so therefore this standard of care cannot be uniform and cannot be implemented across the nation at one point of time it will solely depend on the epidemiological trend and which part of the curve we are and what is the status of healthcare facility and capability capacity and capability should be considered at the same time so if you ask me that this national graph will or the curve will not dictate the adoption or not 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 adoption of the crisis standard of care it will be the local situation depending on the state or or the city that will dictate and the healthcare facility and capability at that point of time that will dictate the uh, adoption of crisis standard of care now just to continue on build the concept there are few more things which we need to understand now it is easy to you know uh, switch from one standard of care to another care or one response to another but what exactly are the trigger points where do we do that there are certain things again in in terms of uh, technical terms which we need to remind ourselves the one is the first one which is very very important is called trigger the trigger is a decision point which is based on changes in the availability of resources that requires adaptation to healthcare service delivery along the care continuum which we already discussed and in crisis care there is crisis care again trigger is again of two types one is called scripted trigger which is a pre defined decision point that can be initiated immediately upon recognizing an associated indicator scripted trigger leads to scripted tactics now what is a scripted tactics a tactics that is pre determined and can be listed as a checklist or on a checklist typically implemented by frontline personnel with minimal analysis let me give an example for example if i am working in a town which has got say 200 uh, beds sorry 200 beds to operate at and in the night of saturday there were suddenly influx in the hospital and in sunday morning we found that there is a need to create 100 more beds immediately because the patients are being operating continuously and all that so therefore we now clearly understand the only thing we need to do is that we need to create this extra bed 
And if we plan correctly, we must have designated hospitals or have a plan in the existing hospital to increase the beds. And we quickly increase the beds and depute some personnel from other hospitals to cater. Now, this is very easy to understand. And this decision can be carried out by frontline personnel. For example, the local civil surgeon or the district magistrate can implement this decision. Now, this is called scripted trigger and scripted tactics. Now, there will be situation, there can be situation, which is not like this, which requires, so there is a decision point that requires analysis and leads to implementation of non-scripted tactics. What are non-scripted tactics? Is a tactics or it is a situation or a set of action which has to be done, which is based on analysis, multiple or uncertain indicators, recommendations, and in certain circumstances with previous experience. Now, this is where the crisis standard of care is very, very complex. Now, let me give you another example. Say for the same town, which is now having 100 patients, is also flooded by heavy torrential rain. So that the hospitals are now submerged up to the floor. All the roads are flooded. The electricity is cut off. But there are COVID patients on ventilators as well. Now, this is a difficult situation, which was not thought before. And now this has happened. Now, there cannot be any checklist. There cannot be any, you know, one expert or one decision which quickly be made. And here there is a need to set up an expert committee, either locally or regionally or even nationally to help this place because this place may not have the capacity to respond to this. Non-scripted trigger and non-scripted tactics, which sometimes are very, very important in crisis standard of care. And there lies the importance of collaborating the right <clears throat> mix of professionals. So if the doctors only make that decision, they will be only concentrating on the hospitals. If the uh, bureaucrats make that decision, they will be only concentrating on administrative things and so on and so forth. So there is a you know need for balanced approach of involving the clinicians, uh, the uh, public, uh, public health experts, which are very important in this situation because after all, this is a public health emergency. This is a global public health emergency. Sometimes I feel that the public health experts are not being heard. Now, the, these are the situation and times the public health expert advice is extremely important. And thereafter, the other machinery and sometimes the armed forces are also necessary even to deal with COVID scenario. And we have seen in Delhi that the DRDO was called off, the ITBP was called, and armed forces was called. And there are certain interventions which were done and now Delhi NCR, as, it, as on today, it looks stable and hopefully it should pass like this. Now, one more important, uh, sorry, one more important concept on how, what are the links of crisis standard of care? Now, of course, this is the US uh, you know, way of working. However, certain components are applicable in our system. So I'm not going in detail. I just want you to focus on two bottom of the uh, uh, pyramid structures. The one is local healthcare systems, and the second one is healthcare coalitions. Now, these are the two most important and basic foundations of how we should respond into this scenario. Or otherwise, also. Now, local healthcare systems. We have seen when it failed in terms of testing, tracing, isolating, the number of cases goes up and the, they are and the patients get more sick and they go to the hospitals and hospitals are not ready and you know there are consequences. But if the patients are being segregated by testing, tracing, isolation, and then you know we have seen development of COVID care centers, home isolation, home quarantine guidelines come up which is again an element of crisis standard of care because this is the first time, at least I have seen a guideline which has come for home isolation and treatment and so on and so forth. The second one, which is equally important is healthcare coalitions. Now, we have understood that no one hospital can handle COVID. 
and there are situations when the government has passed orders of blanket block of percentage of beds in hospitals where we have seen the large hospitals able to manage medium to small hospitals they were trying to cope up but very small hospitals are really struggling now under this situation one thing which works very well is healthcare policies there is no need to create covid care facility in every hospital of every size an area wise designation should be given if we follow this uh, principle and bigger hospitals will collaborate with the smaller hospitals bigger hospitals will have intensive care facilities so they will have the sick patients treated there and then thereafter there will be cascade effect and mild to moderate patients can be treated into smaller hospitals and therefore also you know we follow two approaches one is dedicated covid hospital and other hospitals or we can do this healthcare coalition approach and all that sometimes during covid we have found that there is a need for specialist consultation now we know very well specialists especially you know super specialty doctors are not present in every hospital especially in terms of medium and small size hospital so therefore in healthcare coalition it will be very very helpful and now with the help of the new telemedicine guideline which the uh, government of india and mc has issued it is very much possible to provide specialty advice over telehealth and that should be used both from doctor to patients and from hospitals to hospitals which is again a very very important component of this care now this is you know yeah, the last slide on the crisis standard of care and then i will go to specific example this is the foundation of crisis standard of care so at the bottom there are ethical consideration and legal authority environment which i was talking then there is an engagement in terms of provider community development of indicators and triggers and then implementation of process and operations and on both sides you can see two elements which are equal important in all these blocks are education and information sharing which is very very important and then there are layers of performance improvement on this if we put all these five pillars of hospital care public health out of hospital care ems emergency management and public safety then it makes real sense and then of course we have the layer of local and state government and in our country we have central government so this is how a crisis standard of care is organized and these are the elements or pillars or foundation the way i want to describe you crisis standard of care now reason i put one ventilator on the left side is just to <clears throat> make us remind that there are many places which are running behind ventilators there are many governments many authorities which are supplying ventilators so ventilators are not equivalent to the care are not equivalent to crisis standard of care it is much more complex issue and just by supplying ventilators will not make any difference in in areas where there is no healthcare capacity or healthcare capability and instead of ventilator we were just discussing before uh, the starting of the lecture if you really want to distribute one thing which saves life in covid care is pulse oximeter because pulse oximetry recognition of hypoxia early hypoxia and sending them to hospital has been proven even in this country as very very helpful measure in treating and saving patients life so there are five elements to clear key elements strong ethical grounding which we were talking about integrated continuing community and provider engagement assurance regarding legal authority and environment in forms of guidelines which government of india is or the state is releasing clear indicators triggers and lines of responsibility this is where we have to improve upon this is what is lacking at at this point of time and of course we need evidence based clinical process and operation we should continuously weigh the current evidence and change the guideline if it is required and as a country we should adopt the measures or the treatment which can be given to the mass population and we should reserve the therapies which are under experiment or which can be tested and tried in a resourceful environment so that is again very very important 
Now I'll give you specific example, start with EMS or pre-hospital care strategy. Now, certain things which works good in, in this kind of situation is <clears throat> in, in pre-hospital environment is you can expect that when you set up a helpline or use people tend to use the uh, ambulance helpline in the panic situation, there will be very high call volume. So the first response which happened in Delhi also, the helpline got clogged. So the first thing which can you can do is as a as a conventional also, you can put an auto answer capability. And in crisis situation, you should actually trace the calls and answer those calls which are very, very important or potential threat to life if you cannot answer all the, all the calls. And this, however, this requires a medically trained dispatcher. So this is one point which has worked well in crisis. In terms of response, in, in addition to the conventional EMS fleet, you can use the other resources which are used for transport. For example, uh, in, in, if you see uh, Delhi situation, if the ambulance service is exhausted, which was not exhausted, luckily, you can use the uh, PCR vans, which anyway uh, deal with uh, trauma patients or road accident victims and take them to hospital. So that can be used. Of course, they have to be treated. Now, in terms of standard of ambulance, if you do not have an ALS capability always, you don't need to be much worried under this situation. You can use any, any capability. But in, and in extreme situations, in, it happened in New York also, that at certain point of time for, for two weeks, I clearly remember, they were not resuscitating patients who, un, who had a cardiac arrest outside the hospital. This is because their primary job at that point of time was to transport patients who are salvageable. And they were bringing them to the uh, emergency department of New York hospitals. Of course, they were also flooded, but they were not resuscitating. Now, in conventional situation, this is almost unacceptable. But in crisis situation, they had adopted this. So what we need to remember that in crisis situation, you need to do a very brief patient assessment and transport as early as possible. Also, in, in terms of COVID, that in, in terms of uh, healthcare safety, professional safety, we need to remember that the people who are going into community, they have no ability to screen each and everybody. So they have to be in proper uh, PPE. They have, we now know there are additional symptoms like loss of test or smell. So instead of just a temperature check, people should be screened. Uh, aerosol generating procedures should be avoided as much as possible. And the patient should be encouraged if they are using their own inhalers and other medications. And they, they should be asked to bring that to the hospital because there, there can be you know, drug shortage or that particular drug may not be available. So if you ask the patients by phone who are coming to hospital to bring their own medications and use that in addition to you know, whatever treatment is required for COVID, that will be very, very helpful because in, in generally, uh, the hospital doesn't allow outside medications because of medication safety and other issues. This is one exceptional situation. And now this can be implemented. Again, uh, as we all know, we have to restrict the use of oxygen driven nebulizers uh, when inhalers uh, and air driven substitutes, which are easily available, should be used. Because if you use oxygen, it will generate aerosol and the aerosol density will may increase tremendously in the ambulance. Occupation uh, center, all of your experts will quickly uh, you know, uh, make one small point and then move forward. In terms of occupational health center, uh, you all know that there has to be a protocol of self-reporting, screening, testing, and isolation of the workforce. And this should always be implemented. This is, I see, implemented in many industries uh, by, uh, by the industrial health experts, which are there uh, <clears throat> employed in the uh, industrial campus. And in case there is a surge or sudden deterioration of health of any employees transferred to the nearest facility capable of handling the, uh, you know, the situation. 
and this should be determined by a prior hand because ferrying patients from one hospital to another hospital is not will not serve purpose and can be dangerous at times however you need to check the you know availability of bed and lesson and third use telehealth wherever possible to reduce the contacts of suspected patients even within the occupational health center so all the workforce may not come to the occupational health center as they were coming before because you know there is a small problem so they visit the center this is the occupational health colleagues can use telehealth to reduce the contact just like we are trying to use it sorry uh which studied the behavior of occupational health service during covid-19 in uk and they found that the 56% of the occupational health service they offered a dedicated telephone line and 46% had a dedicated covid inquiries inbox and there was a change the behavior of which to cope up this pandemic and having dedicated helpline to manage the situation was found very very helpful so if you have a health center which caters to a large amount of workforce and if not a dedicated helpline maybe you can there at this point of time to have that and that will again serve two purpose and of course it will do the physical fit of the employee into the clinic also by just by self reporting and talking to the employee you can find out or you can <clears throat> out the problems or symptoms earlier than a physical visit so dedicated helpline at this point of time i will say is is a must in every occupational health center for the workforce it caters to now in terms of emergency department there is a lot of effort going on on resetting the emergency department care because one of the major changes which covid has brought to the society is social change. now i am sure that you have ideas experience to visit any hospital's emergency room and you see that most of the time it is crowded by patients by attendants or by even a big large crowd also now this is a gone case now this cannot be allowed and this this should be avoided at all cost both for patient safety both for attendant safety and both for uh, healthcare worker safety now this is very easy to said than done there is a series of changes which need to be done to do this and let me come to that and i'll refer to the position statement which was issued on 6th of may by the royal college of emergency medicine okay. and they came up with a very very practical recommendations which are you are not audible sir your screen has gone i think weak signal yeah audio audio both so, i think he has been disconnected actually ah uh, he's back yes sir uh, you are not audible and uh, you can hear your screen sir i screen can you see can you hear me yeah we can hear yes, you your voice is there thanks okay can you see no. my screen no sir you have to get out from the screen sharing and then again uh, relog uh, in this okay just hold on one second okay now no sir uh, so you have to actually you have to stop screen sharing and then again you have to read log yeah i just did it yeah now it is yeah. now it is there so i 
just uh, stop my video to save yeah. some yeah 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 bands with yeah. yeah so yeah so uh, the recommendations uh, are the five uh, actually that there are five fundamental aims the first one of course we just talked that at a cost department should not be the reservoir of the hospital or health care acquired infection secondly it should not be crowded again the hospital itself cannot be crowded again and we know very well people are not visiting hospital for the fear of covid and you know these sort of things and we now understood that emergency care must be designed to look after vulnerable patients safely because this is an issue uh, which was ongoing but now this has to be solved and finally it has to be a workplace for staff so what we do for infection control of course we need to have that <clears throat> staff safety in terms of personal protective equipment and process to consider infection control leading to reduced hospital acquired infection and we test with rapid turnout results so that we can quickly uh, make decisions and move the patients if required now what we do in terms of uh, you know uh, infection control there has to be a separate place for seeing patients who are having suspected symptoms versus no symptoms and this is the first thing which most of the department are doing also and if you go to uh, such places the patient should be encouraged to symptoms in the front end and then should be separated immediately and there are certain guidelines around that in terms of reducing crowding and improving safety we must understand that there are critical illness and injury which this department see and there are non time critical presentations now for critical illness and injury what we can do in addition to what we are doing is we can have now technology deployed to the ambulance or ambulance services or ambulance network so that the receiving hospital can clinical detail the patient for example now we get prior hand information if a covid positive patient comes to our hospital by either phone or whatsapp so we are prepared the department is prepared now this can should be replicated as as much as possible in other cases also now in terms of non time critical presentation what we need to realize that the clinicians from all other specialties or all sphere of practice is now going to be much more involved to give an early opinion and therefore decision to admit or decision to start definitive care this was always a, you know a, a kind of a drawback or shortcoming i will say but now to safeguard the hospital safeguard the clinicians the nurses and safeguard the department this opinion should be available as soon as possible again i will stress on the use of telemedicine if the physical opinion cannot be given at the bedside now we also need to do or use certain scales or scores or index to make decision so i am just going to uh, it has just been published it's actually in the uh, pre publication stage this just comes in annals which is called qcsi which is quick covid 19 severity index and you can see that it measures only three variables respiratory rate pulse oximetry and oxygen flow which can be measured in any part of the country right now if you have a pulse oximeter <clears throat> and a quick a qcsi can be obtained what is the benefit of qcsi the research showed the qcsi cut off above 3 at a sensitivity of 0.79 in predicting progression of respiratory failure so we'll clearly understand the patients or quickly segregate the patients who are <clears throat> heading to respiratory failure because respiratory failure is another thing which you often miss or often judge wrongly and put the patients either in the ward or in somewhere else and waste time again there are higher cut off value and higher prediction on respiratory failure so qcsi although this is a small study and there is a need for further studies which must have been undergone different part of the world right now but this is tools like this should be used to make decisions even in the front end of the healthcare the other problem is that the patients under active specialty care who present with a problem relating to that specialty 
should be managed through their existing specialist team. And this might include patients with post-operative problems and complications of their disease or its treatment. Now, one of the common practice, especially in this country, is to ask the patients to come to emergency department just for simple advice or decision making. This should not occur right now because they, if this happens, it leads to overcrowding and these patients are again vulnerable and they have to stay considerable amount of time inside these departments and in, term, in terms they will get COVID or if they are already COVID positive or COVID suspected, they will, there is a possibility of spreading the infection. Therefore, this specialist team care or follow-ups now onwards should be done at a different place. Of course, there is a need for physical redesigning in terms of flow and the new term which is evolving is called split emergency department and split emergency department is just a replica what I would like to remind you that you know in our medical colleges we've seen the hospital operations or the hospital buildings are sprayed horizontally okay those kind of stuff actually will be required where the patients will be segregated and can be placed and the care can go off in an acceptable distance so maybe those hospital designs or those department designs will come back in future to avoid this possibility of infection and spread of infection. I talked of test, testing and the results of testing should be very, very, uh, you know, readily available because if we delay in testing, there will be delay in decision making. And in many situations, we now see the COVID testing is delayed for even 24 to 48 hours. Now, this is when we have to either segregate the patients or make an effort to have the test results as soon as possible. Because if these patients continue to stay in emergency department and the emergency department get overcrowded, then there will be again possibility of infection and both for the patients and healthcare staff. And finally, <clears throat> there has to be evidence-based metrics to support what is defined as crowding and when we should take action. So there are calculators like NEDOCS is one example where you, you just put your institutional you know, capacity in terms of number of emergency beds, number of hospital beds, what are the number of total patients and you know, so on and so forth. And you can compute what is the status of emergency. This will allow the people on ground to make further decisions either to admit or to transfer or to segregate patients as soon as possible. In England or in, in the NHS, they are actually reviewing the current metrics that and implement the changes which will reduce the crowding and promote good quality care. <clears throat> so finally, I'll come to the ICU. ICU, as we know, is one of the most strategic area and uh, one of the most talked after because not only there is a uh, lack of ICU beds as we believe, but also there is a serious lack of ICU professionals on ground. And as we know, there will be you know, some percentage of patients who will be required intensive care. And intensive care of COVID sometimes get very complicated. It's not very easy to deal with and it requires proper planning in terms of capacity and capability. So what are the <clears throat> strategies that can be very, very helpful? First of all, we need to create an inventory of potential ICU resources for a surge in demand for every healthcare facility. For example, physical ventilators beds are always beds available in operating room, post-operative care, cath recovery unit, which should be. Then who are the staff which can help in this situation, like staff with ICU training? Supplies and spaces to deliver the medications and uh, you know disposable items. The second point is establish the identification triggers for initiation of triage, such as clinical demand, which reaches a crisis stage, and implement the crisis standard of care as we you know spoken. And again, we need to have a central triage committee of the region tasked with coordination and standardization. This include representation from key stakeholders like medical, nursing, ethics, law, because these are complex decisions as happened in Italy of withstanding ventilatory care to certain patients. This is not going to be very easy. Okay. 
So there is a, another <clears throat> uh, beautiful rapid practice guideline which uh, which came out, came out in uh, June eighth, uh, month before, and they strategically looked into how to manage the ICU surge in COVID crisis and what is the evidence behind that. So in terms of burden of critical care, as we can see that the experts are suggesting planning and resource allocation. Of course, there is a weak recommendation, low quality evidence, and we need to develop on this. And also important is to planning critical discussed and should require, assume 70% of ICU patients will require any type of support. Now, this is not true in our setup. There are many patients who are in ICU who, is, who does not need ventilatory support, including NIV or uh, <clears throat> high frequency nasal oxygen cannula. Now this has to be locally uh, built. In terms of uh, crisis response strategy, uh, the suggestion is to develop hospital protocols for intubation as well as high flow oxygen, increase the quantity of standard of full featured ventilators according to projected numbers, and in the setting of shortage of standard full featured ventilator, the suggestion you use alternative device that provide invasive mechanical ventilation, including long term ventilators, transport ventilator, anesthesia gas machines can be used or MRI compatible ventilators, which are anyway lying into MRI the, or the radiology department. So these are also used. Fortunately, in our country, there are all, all you know, invention and uh, we are now having access to many low cost ventilators. Some of them are useful. Some of them are, you know, having questionable uh, efficacy, but ventilators are being available in many parts of the country. Now, in terms of, uh, Staff, as we all know, that uh, there is a staff shortage. So the first and foremost, the hospital can stop the elective medical and surgical procedure. They can expedite the credential process. They can really train people, redeploy people, and provide just-in-time training and simulation sessions for non-ICU clinicians. And this is where I will emphasize uh, in the next uh, two, three, how we can create that environment. We also need to understand that the ICU or ICU um, complex is an area where there will be high viral load because of uh, frequent use of AGPs and other stuff. So maintaining the staff safety, reducing the exposure of the uh, staff and maintaining a proper roster and training them at least in donning and doffing <clears throat> is going to be very, very helpful. As with our experience, we found doffing was the most uh, you know, vulnerable process in terms of healthcare safety. And the staff who were casual in the doffing area, as we uh, we can understand that, you know, after an hours of work, people get breathless, they are, you know, advisors even get hazy, and there is a tendency to doff quickly. And the people who did that, the staff, they were the ones who were infected with COVID. Of course, Luckily, we did not have any casualty of healthcare workers so far in our setup. But most of the time, when you interview people, it was doffing, doffing, and doffing where the people did mistake and they contracted COVID, not with direct exposure of uh, patients, even with AGPs. Now, few resources which are going to be very, very useful. The first one I'd like to mention is developed by Society of Critical Care Medicine of US. And they quickly came up with a program which is available online, which they call as critical care for non-ICU clinician. And this is a free resource, which and they do frequent webinars. And I will suggest that the healthcare setup, which have this crisis, or which are anticipating this crisis, find out the group of clinicians who are available who can work in ICU. And they can quickly un undergo this course. Of course, they need to work under supervision of a trained intensivist. But one intensivist then can manage a large number of through this training uh, through this clinician. So this is very very helpful. The second, which I found is helpful, is an ICU strategy which was adopted in uh, Sloan Kettering in New York. So what they did is they developed 
a pop up icu or a novel icu so they took a single room like in many of our hospitals we have and they created a glass window into the you know conventional door of the single room okay and they did <clears throat> some modifications which are very very helpful to reduce the exposure to the patient for example the first thing they did is they used a webcam which is of course not shown in the picture to completely monitor the patient the second thing which is very very important and very novel which i found that they used an ipad which was connected to the monitor of the patient who was inside and most of our devices which we use monitors are hipa compliant and they can be connected with little use of technology with even a computer or an ipad or and then quickly create a replica of the patient monitor and the nurse was actually sitting just outside the room and he or she was using a workstation and uh, you know the pp bags and other things were hanged hanged out of the patient area in out of the room so this not only reduced the the staff exposure but also provided a real time monitoring of the patient and this can be easily created in many of our hospitals using our single rooms the other option which is again of course uh, used in some parts of our country as well and this is from holy uh, medical center from new jersey what they did is they created three negative shell space icu in an empty auditorium now what they did is they created negative pressure and all the patient bed were positioned uh, with their head towards the outer walls and the nursing station if you look carefully is actually around uh, across the outer wall and that through that station they were attaching cables ventilator circuits and iv infusion tapings and nurses were monitoring from the side and clearly see the professional inside and this all again can be created in many of our empty spaces nearby you know adjacent to the hospitals or even we can uh, create the tents with negative pressure and creating negative pressure is not a very difficult job you can use the exhaust fans the strong ones which we also used in uh, one of our icu which were not uh, ready down some negative pressure and created an outflow because if you look into the who uh, document which talks of uh, special uh, you know uh, how to create these spaces who suggest that that if you do not have anything you can simply use an exhaust fan or even open a window and use fans and continue to carry patient care in, in if you if you cannot create in a technologically advanced negative care so that should be brought in mind now there is other course which is particularly on mechanical ventilation again this is developed by harvard it is available free of cost and any clinicians can again do it online and this is again very very helpful which i found in some of our uh, junior doctors which underwent this course they have found this very helpful and subsequently we posted them in icu under supervision of intensivists and they did very well uh, in terms of patient care and uh, ventilator management so this is again one more suggestion <clears throat> and the last one now this website Uh, which is developed by uh, nick mark and his colleagues it's called onecareic.com sometimes you know uh, we have clinicians who often struggle with the knowledge and application of knowledge now this website produces icu algorithms icu charts and icu guidelines in one page and this is again very very helpful for those clinicians who are struggling on what to use and how to use and you know new to icu and those kind of setup these are easily downloadable you can download it you can print it you can post it uh, in the icu or it can be shared over whatsapp or whatever media and it is very very helpful to summarize the intensive care uh, pearls and practice which can be very useful for clinicians who are not accustomed to working icu setup it is useful for nurses as well so i will strongly recommend to Reference this website whenever needed 
in terms of icu uh, knowledge and uh, icu practice and icu capability now having discussed in concluding remarks i want to introduce another concept uh, which uh, is again uh, raised in 2007 by gabardi kellan and his colleagues which is called lifeboat ethics now we all understand that we are undergoing a very high cost event and whenever we have this high consequence event we have to do certain things to save our life save our community and save the world just like if we are in a lifeboat and we are trying to save ourselves or you know a, a group of us we will definitely forego certain needs and we will try to save our life first so and that is our internal uh, uh, <clears throat> understanding that is the ethos where we should work the society should work and the medical community should work so gabor kellen introduced the life uh, life boat ethics uh, it was used first in us in 1970 to discuss the distribution of limited food supplies to the poverty stricken nations battling with chronic famines in us and we are in one such situation and we are witnessing a pandemic and we have clearly realized that no health system in the world is capable of dealing a surge of this magnitude so adopting the crisis standard of care in my mind is the only way to conserve the resources do the best for the most and the time is now and in conclusion i'd like to say that from crisis comes learning from adversity comes the opportunity and there is no better opportunity than this for us the medical professionals the healthcare professionals to show our leadership to guide the society and to save the mankind as much as possible using all our resources and using the principles of crisis standard of care thank you very much thank you sir uh, rightly said sir the from the crisis comes learning and from adversity comes the opportunity so it was a great learning from you sir uh, uh, you can stop sharing your screen and we can have some question answer session with you sir although yes. you have covered uh, maximum of uh, our queries and how to take forward our mission to uh, control this pandemic in our respective hospitals and uh, respective industries sir uh, one question i would like to ask you sir uh, what is the impact of uh, covid 19 pandemic Uh, on different type of medical emergencies which are reporting to the hospitals uh, for example like cardiac uh, trauma accidents drug alcohol abuse back pain migraine or breathlessness how they are uh, what is the impact of uh, covid on these uh, emergencies okay so you asked a very important question and uh, i will say uh, the rest, the effect is good and bad so i will i'll first say the good effects of it so you can see that in a country like us there is a major decrease in number of trauma patients or accidents because of lockdown and other things although there were sad incidents of the migrant laborers dying on the road side and all that but if you look at the numbers they have reduced the bad is you know that there are two things happening on the side by side first is there is delay in seeking emergency response and this is not only happening in our country in new york in the month of march and april the number of people died in cardiac arrest outside the hospital was twice as the normal uh, months so that is an indication that the people are delaying in uh, you know seeking emergency care because of the uh, fear of covid secondly there are you know chronic conditions which can aggravate in, in in a situation like this when the ebola happened in africa there was a tremendous rise in uh, malaria similarly 
we can see there are lot of you know patients who are presenting you know in fact we have two three patients who are presented with covid but later on found to be having uh, tuberculosis latent tuberculosis so there is a possibility and the, in fact it is happening real time that there is a increase in some of the chronic diseases which is otherwise controlled and lastly if an healthcare system is collapsing and it is very much overwhelmed in treating covid the other uh, patients will generally suffer uh, i have a question uh, first yeah. of all i compliment uh, dr kohl for a beautiful uh, presentation on all the aspects of management of this crisis and uh, this problem we are in fact facing day in and day out in the hospitals uh, i i am presently working in a 416 bedded hospital in cannot be the railway hospital where we are running 180 exclusive beds for covid and in fact we are also facing this shortage of manpower now my question is say in the covid side even in the icu we are posting our ophthalmologist our dermatologist and all doctors by rotation so is the provisions of cpa stand suspended during this period this is my question i mean consumer protection act Hey, so I'm not a legal expert on it. So, but I can say this: the uh, as far as I know, you know, now the Epidemic Act is invoked around the country. Mm. So, under Epidemic Act and under the you know the Disaster Management Act, which is invoked, the healthcare professionals are somewhat protected, and they are they they even if some problem goes up to court, the court will always look into the prevailing situation. and look into the capacity and capability of the healthcare systems and and the resources at that point of time and make decisions because because of this you know uh, legal sanction of epidemic we are somewhat protected but a gross negligence will not be spared okay and my second question is now the same thing will be required when we will deescalate i mean the crisis will be deescalated and we will be normalizing the services in the hospital <clears throat> how 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 to go about it so i will take i will first say the time has not come okay so you need to be very very you know guarded in deescalating the situation and uh, you should always consult the local authority and local public health experts on the possibility of certain things one is you know the sometimes if the testing uh, goes down Uh, the uh, tracing and isolation also goes down so you need to understand testing test versus population second is the possibility of a second wave in in certain region so as on today what we are doing is we have of course we have toned down our you know number of beds and uh, you know operations but we are in a state of uh, preparedness where if needed we can go back to Uh, you know a full fledged covid operation in 72 hours okay. so that should be a you know a ideal approach at this point of time thank you sir rajgopal sir yeah i have a few questions uh, dr tamari first of all of course a wonderful exposition of uh, what we need to do now you know as unilever we have operations around the world and what we did recently a few months back was to actually purchase ventilators and get gifted to many countries and many big hospitals we run hospitals in plantations in kenya and in tanzania so we have icu beds we have the people and all but what we also did there was to give them a lot of bipap machines you know the small ones which we thought could be used as a useful substitute for a regular ventilator if push comes to serve and if we need to increase the surge capacity and the capability of course is a problem you already said that but at least something in terms of uh, you know helping us So I just wanted your opinion on that one. The second one is that in India, we have faced this sort of a problem in Andhra Pradesh. It is going through a worse crisis now. Hospitals are running out of beds, and uh, Philips has just come out with a modular ICU. It's a nine-bedded ICU. It's got everything inside: ventilators and everything, basically. Just requires fourteen hundred square foot. It's a plug-and-play model. So we are seriously considering whether we can, as a part of our CSR, partner with some of the hospitals and ask them to put it up. because we don't want to invest in you know healthcare and healthcare professionals just want to see whether something like this can be of use as we you know as we go along 
and your idea on oximeters is wonderful we do that to every mild and moderate case across the world give them oximeters and i think we have been able to save a substantial amount of lives uh, by getting them into hospital at the right time the final point which i just wanted to make uh, was uh, you know i saw your the uh, quick index for the covid uh, index which you which you showed me in terms of three main parameters there are a lot of other indicators like liver function tests and all i was intrigued to find that you the people didn't include interleukin 6 as one of the indicators increasingly it's coming up as you know one of the uh, biomarkers for it and the last comment is an exhaust ventilation it's a good idea except that the exhaust ventilation has to suck in air into the place where you have the patients obviously not you know throw it out as a conventional exhaust so just right. if i could have your views on some of these thoughts okay so you uh, Uh, I know I commend your efforts and uh, your organization who are trying to you know help people in areas where the normal conventional care is not possible or exhausted. So uh, in terms of uh, putting modular ICU or gifting ventilators, uh, that is very very useful. But before that, I will stress the use of high frequency nasal cannula. Yeah. In yeah, our that also. Yeah. In our experience. we have been we are not using vent, invasive ventilation uh, for many patients yeah. most of our patients uh, are on high frequency nasal cannula yeah. or uh, bypass in fact when we asked the government of maharashtra what they want this is what they said give us these one so we have given them a substantial amount of this uh, high frequency nasal cannulas high flow yeah. high flow because yeah. if you look at the, uh, the cohort which uh, of new york and they did not do well in in state of you know in spite of the fact that new york has have some best of the ems emergency department hospitals because they were intubating all patients in emergency department and they had very high mortality because of that and finally we learned that invasive ventilation is not at all good for most of the covid patients so by that time with this learnings india has used lots of uh, you know non invasive ventilation high frequency nasal cannula and that is actually the need of the hour uh, not the invasive ventilation and sec secondly again coming back to capability if you do not have on site physicians to take care there are uh, tele icu solutions which actually physi philips developed uh, you know almost 10 12 years back which uh, uh, which they called as criticare if i am not wrong and uh, there are you know institutions companies group of uh, individuals who are managing uh, tele icus tele icu only need professionals who can intubate at the bedside that is the only capability you need to have on the other end rest of the things they will be able to manage and using tele icu uh, in in certain countries uh, you know like bangladesh and uh, you know couple of states are asking tele icu solutions right now is actually reducing mortality Uh, rather than you know physical presence of uh, icu doctors so tele icu is going to be very very helpful dr tamrish uh, i have two questions uh, for you uh, yes. number one this crisis the standard of care is uh, seems to be an essential feature which is required in nabh standards the current nabh standards somehow have missed this aspect in hospital capability for accreditation number one number two i do not find the crisis standard of care also in the ndma guidelines which are national guidelines for mass casualty management which uh, ministry of health for biological disaster being the nodal crisis standard of care is so crucial uh, which is uh, now uh, i think this this has to be taken up uh, post covid maybe or within the covid uh, because it seems it's going to go on for more than one or two years so don't you feel there is a need to take up this aspect of incorporating crisis standard of care in the existing standards which are uh, and nbqsl standards are also there nabh standards are also there i don't know whether uh, isqua has incorporated it or or us standards have incorporated this for hospital care that is question one question 2 relates to uh, this issue which uh, dr rajgopal also uh, uh, has raised and you very rightly uh, reacted high frequency nasal cannula uh, usage and uh, cpap and bipap usage uh, non invasive uh, ventilation uh, capabilities 
is a lacunae in most of the emergency medicine physicians in India. If you see the capabilities of personnel in ICUs, in some of the major hospitals, uh, their understanding of non-invasive ventilation, uh, don't you feel there is a specific need to strengthen non-invasive ventilation skills, which are practical skills within the emergency medicine physicians and paramedical personnel? So you asked two very, very important question, but before that, I, I just missed the last question of Dr. Rajagopal on, on the QCSI. Uh, so QCSI is a smaller version of the uh, uh, COVID severity index and COVID severity index has got all the lab parameters, okay, which is difficult to uh, gauge at the point of entry. So therefore QCSI was developed just like from SOFA score, QSOFA was developed for sepsis CS, uh, QCSI is developed from CSI. Now, one of the very important parameters and very easy to obtain in COVID from a you know, complete uh, blood count is the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. And NL ratio is a very useful parameter in detection of, of the severity and the prognosis of COVID patients. So just to add to you know, the question I missed. Now, coming back to Dr. Rajiv Jain, is, you have raised absolutely very important point. Now you see what was our idea before COVID of handling disasters in terms of hospital or even a country. Our idea was limited up to handling a surge from a mass casualty, from earthquake, so on and so forth. Therefore, our guidelines, if you see, there, if you look at NDMA guidelines, there is biological hazards and you know all that. We have never took pandemic seriously. And in fact, the whole world never took pandemic seriously. Therefore, you can see that you know there is a struggle into the healthcare system if you see any country. So there is a great need to add this right now to every standard, not only healthcare standards, to every standard, because COVID is not only affecting healthcare, it is affecting every other industry and every walks of life. You have to have a chapter on how do you handle pandemic situation in case it happens again, Be, if it is NABH, if it is ISCUA, uh, in fact, ISCUA has just added one small module on crisis and how to handle crisis, but that's a generic yes. module. There is yes. a need to develop the pandemic. So pandemic response has to be part of every, every standard as we speak. And every industry must take note that how they will handle the pandemics. Now, we never understood that we have, we will land in so much of crisis with the migrant laborers. And, you know, without blaming anybody, we, we have seen how they have suffered because they, are, they, are, they had to go back to their own place and now they want to come back and, you know, what happened to them. So it has exposed, you know, a lot of things like this in terms of healthcare capacity also, in terms of our lacuna. And this is the time to adopt new techniques and new strategies. I'll just give you a small example. We have a high number of redundant force of eye doctors, pharmacists, physiotherapists in this country. Largest number of pharmacists is in India. We are not able to use them because we do not have the regulatory power. We, do not, we don't have the framework to quickly train them and use them for uh, this kind of situation. But now we need to seriously think. And if we don't do it now, we will probably suffer very badly again when it happens. And this is yet not over. We are still into the you know, crisis. So uh, any other question from Dr. Shanbag, sir? Yeah, thanks, uh, Sandeep and uh, Dr. Kamarish. Excellent presentation. Uh, very, very methodical and very, very clear in whatever you say. Taking your point, which you raised just now forward, you know, are we going to move from crisis to crisis? Whether we'll learn now and our learnings now will be implemented like Dr. Rajiv Jain said. You know, even today, you know, 
if you go to the industry, probably fire drills are there, everything is there. But if you take in the community, no such thing exists. People, if there's a fire in the community, everybody reacts in their own, own way. So is that there, there has to be some way of, you know, probably sensitizing the community, probably through schools, colleges, and somewhere, somebody has to take that responsibility and, you know, have, a, as you rightly said, there has to be chapter in every standard. There has to be chapters in every schools and colleges to say, okay, if this happens, what is going to happen tomorrow? Otherwise, we'll just forget it after a year or so when the vaccine comes, everything goes back, and then you'll go back to normal and say, okay, okay till the next pandemic, we'll continue to behave as you want to do. I don't know, any views on this from your side? I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, we need to understand that the last pandemic which has happened was 2018 you know, of influenza pandemic. From that time till now, what has changed is now we are very much globally connected. We live in one planet, Correct. which is connected. In 24 hours, you can travel from one part of the globe to the exactly opposite side. Okay, that is our capability and our connection in terms of trade and in terms of people-to-people uh, uh, -people relations are very intricate. So the spread of virus or you know or any other agent in today's world is very much possible feasible and can be much more dangerous than you know a situation like 1980 so we have to be very very cautious and we have to come up with strategies by which we can quickly adopt social behaviors healthcare uh, uh, structure infrastructure changes and uh, you know evidence based research and you know ultimately vaccine or whatever it is into those things we need to start thinking about it absolutely i agree with you and we need to use this for for the future good of the country and the globe right uh, dr pingle dr shiva if you have any questions or any comments Doctor, I don't have any question, uh, but I have high appreciation for the way Dr. Tamrish has uh, explained the whole subject to us and very systematic way. And it was a very good learning. Thank you so much. My comment is only thing that it was an excellent presentation. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ashish, Dr. Shriniket. Uh, no questions. I just want to appreciate the fact that uh, Dr. Tambrish made uh, the entire presentation very simple, uh, easy to understand. And I think uh, each of us has uh, benefited. Uh, I think the perspective shared uh, were really useful. And uh, it's time to kind of uh, take it back and uh, imbibe the learning, share it across. Thanks. Uh. Shriniket. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Cole, this was a very informative and very interesting session. Uh, thank you very much for taking time for this uh, webinar. Thank you once again. Pawan? Uh, Dr. Tyagra, sir, if you want to say something. Anyway, uh, Dr. Cole, sir, uh, it was a great learning uh, to, from you and uh, uh, whatever you have described, that was much uh, needed in this hour and this guidance was very important and uh, uh, we all know this uh, pandemic will remain for some time uh, till the vaccine comes or uh, uh, some as the time passes by, but still uh, we need to be very careful and very alert on our alert uh, on how to deal with the situations which will be emerging in the times to come. And uh, especially what you said about the optimal uh, utilization of the healthcare facility, that is very important. And we all know that um, this 80% uh, 80, 80 of these COVID-19 patients, they are asymptomatic or mild, with mild symptoms. They, so they won't be requiring the ICU facilities or the hospitalization facilities. So this we need to, uh, we are propagating this uh, among our employees also. Key for If you are COVID positive, you don't have to worry. 
till you develop some uh, symptoms which require hospitalization so we are monitoring all the hospitalization cases and the home isolation cases especially and whenever there there is a need and uh, there is like the trigger point is uh, there then we definitely uh, we get them admitted and we tell them yes uh, you your admission is required so early reporting of the cases with uh, less of the viral load that is very important and we have to we have to take care of the fear and stigma which is there regarding covid so that is that is uh, there in our uh, da daily briefings with the management and uh, with the, our associates also and uh, icu management as you right, rightly said sir uh, that capacity and capability both of them they need to be taken care of we should not uh, bank totally on the capacity without the capability because uh, this we are facing a lot uh, despite so many ventilators and so many sophisticated gadgets uh, they are either uh, not pro being properly used or uh, their effective use is not there so only 5% of this uh, of our of this covid cases they will be requiring this icu facilities with this ventilators and other things so what is required as you rightly said that behavioral change is uh, very important among our uh, population and we need to optimize our healthcare system and uh, accordingly we can do the triaging of our cases uh, so that uh, only the genuine cases who require uh, Uh, emergency facilities icu facilities hospitalization facilities they should go there and uh, overcrowding should be taken care of with the help of the telehealth services uh, that that has to end uh, this emergency helpline we in indian all also we have developed this uh, emergency helpline so anyone who is having this medical emergency uh, he can contact on that that is 24 by 7 and as you rightly said this this is good sir the auto answer facility can be there if the if all the lines are busy then you auto answer facilities can always guide the patient or the relatives where to go what to do so lot of learnings from you sir uh, and as we witness this pandemic we have clearly realized that no health system in the world is capable of dealing uh, this surge of this magnitude this uh, life boat concept is very good sir and definitely will take care of this and adopting the the standard of uh, this crisis standard of care that is the only way to conserve resources to the best uh, for the most and the time is now sir and uh, we will definitely take your learnings uh, down to our management to our employees to our fellow colleagues to our uh, um, patients and uh, it's a good learning definitely sir it's a good learning so if there is no question sir uh, if you have any thing to say uh, dr kohl sir uh, thank you uh, sandeep and others uh, i know this saturday but you exactly now one and a half hour we are sitting and discussing that shows the seriousness of the you know uh, the people who attended this and their willingness to take it forward because implementing the crisis standard of care is actually the real uh, key, uh, you know success and small things actually make a lot of difference so if you can adopt at least two three things which i have spoken and then you know uh, see what uh, difference it makes uh, it will be uh, very very encouraging uh, secondly if, you know i can speak to dan uh, dan hamfling who is the uh, co chair or and the co author of crisis standard of care uh, and ask him to uh, present uh, by himself you know the the concept and uh, we can do one more webinar he already did one for asian society but i can i can ask him uh, to do one more for for your association so uh, if you if you want i can ask dan and dan can present one more time on how he thinks it will be useful definitely we will look forward for this thank you dr tamrish and remember acm uh, the acm in delhi in 2017 where dan and i heard him Uh, really impressive he is uh, so much dedicated to this aspect and this is the way of the future actually it is the weakest link in indian healthcare system seems to be the emergency medical services it is the in go to any hospital even big hospitals most uh, uh, unskilled people may be sometime found in the emergency medicine department and i think that that has opened a window of opportunity i feel uh, that your uh, 
Indian Society of Emergency Medicine as well as Asian Society should put all its resources for strengthening this aspect. Maybe handhold uh, ministries and state governments with health in India seems to be a state subject. This is a, seems to be the most, I think, important or opportune time for Society of Medicine, so, uh, so Emergency Medicine to take its rightful place. Thank you so much. It was wonderful, your branded uh, uh, presentation. I would say, I remember your always presentation is always futuristic, not only state of the art, it goes beyond, it shows the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, we will definitely look forward uh, for more association with you, sir. Uh, this was an initial uh, learning from you during COVID pandemic and we'll keep in touch and we'll uh, keep on um, having more sessions with you with different uh, aspects of what you have told in a summarized form, sir. So uh, I thank you very much for this, sir. And uh, I thank all the participants for sparing the valuable time to attend this academic program. So we are, uh, for your information, we are having it on every Saturday evening uh, at about 6.30 PM. So uh, in, this, uh, in this period of uh, so much of crisis, we keep on uh, associating with our seniors and uh, we try to learn from different specialists and different uh, people who are specialists in their particular field. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you all the participants. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night.